Chapter 24 They were both sleeping when the stampede hit. Scott hadn't thought it was possible for him to nod out, but he was exhausted, hung over, and probably coming down with whatever Tom had. They were still fighting outside, but the pen they had holed up in seemed safe. The sounds of battle had almost become a background drone and had moved away after a while. Scott had been dreaming that he and Tom were explaining what had happened to them to a doubtful audience of company people back on Earth. They were all sitting around a huge wooden table in a dim conference room. At first, the suits had seemed interested as Tom spoke, except Tom kept saying all of the wrong things, and every time Scott opened his mouth, nothing would come out. And all at once, the people started slamming their fists down on the table. One of them, a very tall man in a black shirt, kept yelling, Liar! Liar! And the sounds of their knuckles hitting the wood got louder, more insistent, deafening. Scott snapped awake as the table broke. Oh, shit! Tom jumped up and lurched to the door. Even in the dark pen, Scott could see that Tom didn't look too good, pale and strained. Scott pulled his aching body off the floor and joined him. By now, the noise had drowned out all else. He looked out the crack in the door and felt his mouth gape. The rinth weren't running past the pen, at least not the front, but they could see the dust kicked up by the animals to their right, maybe six or seven metres away. The whole building shook as the thick stream of animals tore past, headed north. Tom said something that Scott couldn't catch. What? Scott couldn't hear his own scream. Tom shook his head and pointed. At first, Scott wasn't sure what he was looking for. Tom was motioning at a transmitting tower, two structures away. Tom finally pointed straight up and then back at the tower. Scott looked at the top and felt his heart jump. A copter hovered there shakily. It was involved in some kind of rescue mission. There was a person trapped on the tower being pursued by... Scott peered closer. The alien creatures from the lector. They watched as the person on the tower, who seemed to be some kind of giant, reached for the strut of the copter and made it. Scott grinned widely as the stranded person made it to the copter in a breathtaking leap and looked at Tom. Tom laughed without sound and clapped Scott on the back. The excitement on Tom's face melted suddenly into horror. Scott looked back at the copter just in time to see it spin down towards the ground, towards them. Something had gone very wrong. One of the creatures had jumped on the roof of the copter and the pilot had panicked. They watched as the flyer spun out of control to crash a few dozen meters past them to the left. The explosion was loud enough to be audible above the stampede. It was getting quieter. The majority of the animals had already gone. By silent ascent, he and Tom opened the door and ran towards the crash, the stench of burning fuel and cooked dirt heavy in the air. The hot night had just gotten hotter. Noguchi opened her eyes as the thunder fell to the sound and heat of a bonfire. Above her, the Ryushi night sparkled with stars. She had a sunburn and there was something wrong. She couldn't move. <laughs> Miriam. Her voice was barely audible. A face appeared over hers, familiar, bearded. Conover? I should have guessed it'd be you. The pilot had to shout to be heard over the final remnants of the stampede. You're lucky to be alive, lady. Noguchi remembered all of it at once as Conover unbelted her and half lifted her out of the wreckage. Broken tusk. The rinth are stampeding and the people went to the desert and Miriam. Who the hell taught you to fly? Behind Conover stood the other one, Strandberg. He looked sick. Nobody, yet, Noguchi said. She sounded weak, hated that she did. All around them were bits of burning wreckage. The main part of the copter was behind them, still on fire. The flames crackled and danced. She leaned heavily on the pilot as they stumbled away from the smashed cockpit. Where's Miriam? She said. The doctor hadn't been next to her when she had come to. It was an effort to look around. Her neck didn't seem to want to hold her head up. Strandberg stepped forward and grabbed her other arm. Listen, we gotta get out of here. The bugs will be back soon. 
On closer inspection, she could see that Strandberg was sick. He looked like she felt. Shaky, pale, nauseous. The last of the rinth had gone. Besides a fading rumble, the only noise was the hiss of fire, and somewhere close by, the piercing trill of a nightmare creature. Miriam, she said again. Broken tusk. <laughs> Miriam had to save him. The pilots ignored her and started pulling her towards one of the holding pens. Noguchi pushed them away and turned back to the remains of the copter. Dr. Revna, the woman who was in the copter with me, I'm not leaving without her. Conover's voice was both apologetic and irritated at once. I didn't see anyone else, he began, and then stopped. Oh, Jesus. Noguchi glanced at both of the pilots, who stood with looks of awe and terror on their faces. She spun back around and felt her heart sink. It was Broken Tusk, surrounded by flames. He carried Miriam Revna in his arms. The Shunde hit the ground, hard, but shouldered the impact well. It helped that he had the time to jump before the Uman flyer had crashed. He stood and winced at the tight feeling in his chest. He had probably re-broken what had started mending. But the host stampede had passed, and the drones were nowhere around, at least for the moment. The Shunde looked around at the burning pieces of material and walked around them slowly. The Umans had been trying to save him, there was no question, and they had probably died for their efforts. He saw a fallen form on the ground, thrown clear of the wreck. The Shande approached it carefully. It did not move. The small figure was turned on its stomach, but he knew what it was before he turned it over. It was the Uman who had tended him, then released him. It was the Uman who had tried to save him from the drones, and had lost its life trying. There was no question that it was Thay Day. Thick Thway dripped sluggishly from deep gashes in its face and neck, and its position suggested a snapped spine. The Shande scooped the tiny body up and paused for a moment, uncertain of what to do with it. Now that the animals were gone, he heard sounds of Uman language from somewhere near, past the largest part of the burning flyer, just a few paces away. The other Umans would want it. For such a brave being, they would want to properly care for it before its usul kwe, final rest. It was no warrior, but it had a sensitivity that Dushande had never seen before, except in the smallest of children. He carried the Uman to the others. There were three. One he recognized as the armed Uman from before. The other two were bigger, but unarmed. They held very still as he approached. The small warrior held no weapon against him now. It ran forward, the hold of its body frantic. The Shande could see that it was not an attack. The warrior reached him and then gently stroked the face of the dead one that he carried, its composure one of sorrow. It repeated something over and over as it touched the dead face. The Shande suddenly remembered the animal loop on his forearm and tapped it quickly. The human's language babbled back at it. The warrior looked up at him, and then motioned for him to set the corpse down. The Shande did it, gently. The human had shown him respect. He would do no less for it in its death. Noguchi stared in shock as she heard her own voice spill out from behind the creature's mask. I'm sorry, Miriam. She pointed to the ground and then back to Miriam's body. Broken Tusk carefully set the doctor's body down and then stepped back. Noguchi knelt over Miriam, could already see that it was too late. That's okay, Machiko. Someone else you cared about. Someone who depended on you, dead. No big deal. Just because it's your fault. She allowed herself one second of pure grief. Her head dropped into her hands and she let out a soft moan of despair and sorrow. The pain was sharp and cruel, the guilt tremendous and stabbing, and she didn't have time for it. Noguchi stood slowly and took a deep breath. The pilots kept their silence. In respect or embarrassment, she didn't know. She turned to look at the warrior, who also gazed at Revna's broken body. His odd mask flickered with strange shadows. 
It's time to put an end to this, she said quietly. Broken Tusk stepped towards her and put one clawed hand on her shoulder. Noguchi did her best to return the gesture, although she couldn't quite reach. It looked like she had an ally, at least for a while. <laughs>